Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon this morning, its theme is wrestling for a blessing. We pray, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and redeemer. Amen. struggling a little bit, wrestling a little bit with how I'm going to begin this sermon, where to begin. I think I'll start by saying it's not actually a negative thing to be wrestling for a blessing. It's a very positive thing. We have many, many blessings from the Lord. For me this week, I was wrestling with which blessing I should receive, I should take hold of. I almost had to reject a blessing this week. Can you guess what those are? Some of you know I actually ended up attending an installation yesterday of my dear brother in Christ in Queens. An installation took place there. I was there with lots of my brothers and we said scripture verses and we were surrounding him showing that through us, through our district, through our synod, we were blessing this man. He was joining this congregation. They were going to be a blessing to him. He was going to be a blessing to them. Lots of blessings around. What a wonderful inspiration that was for them, for me. Struggling, wrestling with the concept for weeks over the fact that the Alcott School next door were having a festival. And my family attended on my behalf. We had wonderful members that came and stood at that stall or sat at that stall and gave out church flyers as well. I was wrestling with this, saying to myself, woe is me, who's going to represent the church? Wrestling with God on this issue, praying about this. And I think it was clear what God said to me. He said, Gordon, you're not the church. You are my blessing. I thank God for you and the fact that you can so well represent Trinity Lutheran Church in all things, especially when I'm not here. It gives you the ability, the inspiration, the motivation to step up and say, I am Trinity Lutheran Church. I am a Christian. I'm a Lutheran. This is my congregation. Have a church flyer. This is what we believe. This is what we confess. Join us. Find out, hear the good news of Jesus Christ this Sunday. Service is at 10. If you're really feeling brave, come to our Bible study at 9. Maybe they'll find out there's a treat waiting for them as well. So again, I certainly wrestled this week, probably for a different reason that Jacob wrestled with God. Though what did Jacob really need another blessing for? Right, He's the one who's... Uh, and in this context, told he's going to be Israel, right? From him comes the 12 tribes of Israel, their father Isaac, their father Abraham, the one given the promise that he will have descendants like the stars in the heavens and the sand on the seashore. But Lord, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. He's already got the inheritance that uh, Isaac was going to give to Esau, but God had promised Jacob and he still kind of got it in an underhanded way. He has this wonderful family again, 11 children already. Big family, servants, cattle. So much so he puts them ahead of himself while he's waiting on the other side of the river to pray. And he does pray. Oh, he prays and he sees God. He wrestles with him because God does always encourage his people, his chosen ones, to pray, to ask for a blessing continually. So Jacob is being righteous in this. He's being faithful in this. Jacob knew it. And you and I know it. He's going to see his brother again after years and years. Whether it was the divine plan or not, Jacob had cheated Esau of his inheritance. He has that inheritance, that official blessing. Esau has an inheritance, by the way. 
but this is the promised inheritance that you will be called the people of God, right? And he confirms that. Your name will be Israel. Through you will be the Messiah. Okay? But so here Jacob is again wrestling with the angel of the Lord for a blessing. Peace, perhaps. Reconciliation, certainly. The one thing we seem to be seeking time and time again, don't we? But you know what? Ironically, this is the one thing we too inherit from God and can never be taken from us, our reconciliation with God. And this reconciliation with God then overflows from this fruit of grace to our neighbor, our brother, if need be, like Jacob and Esau. So what happens when Jacob finally meets his brother Esau, despite the whole controversy over their earthly inheritance, they embrace. Of course they do. They're the sons of the great patriarch Isaac. I'm sure, as was consoled by St. Paul to Timothy, they were brought up from childhood in the faith to trust in God's word and the scriptures. They both know how much more infinitely valuable is their heavenly inheritance. And so between them, there's reconciliation even now. It's with this regard to the same inheritance St. Paul again addresses Timothy in our epistle. I love how Paul draws attention, by the way, to the fact that Timothy has known the scriptures again from childhood or in some translations, infancy. Not very common in an era where the covenant of God is literally in a period of transition, if you remember. And yes, a call out to all those faithful families who bring up their children in the kingdom of God from infancy, from the beginning. But here's the key phrase. All scripture is able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. Through faith in Jesus Christ, verse 15. Why? Because Scripture is God-breathed. Another phrase that could be overlooked. Right? The authority of Scripture. The inspiration of Scripture. The power it holds, rightly so, over those who believe, who subject themselves to their heavenly master because he's also their savior. Because it makes us wise for salvation. And we are equipped for every good work with it. And this is our charge, to preach always. To preach, to proclaim right, with certainty. Because we actually possess the truth. And I think that's what you'll find in a church, ironically, that doesn't proclaim that there is a truth, that there's only relative truth. They don't end up preaching the gospel. They end up preaching on other things. Just an interesting coincidence, or is it? Not every context is absolutely clear in itself. That's true. Sometimes you must rely on another context to clarify, which is scripture, but they make up the truth. And in some cases, even someone else to tell you what the truth is if you don't know or are at least confused on a particular context. But we use context. Hence, Paul's admonition to Timothy. You've been brought up in the word since infancy. The clear advantage to going to someone who from infancy has known the scriptures, and I would even draw a connection to baptism there, where from infancy we know God or he promises to know us. This is so important. 
for people will turn away from the truth. Chapter 4, verse 4. And turn toward myths, right? Remember that when you turn from something, it's not to go nowhere, it's to go towards something else. Again, that concept of repentance. If we're turning away from sin, it's because we're turning toward God, finally. For what? To simply tell us to do the right thing after we turn back from doing the wrong thing? Firstly, to be forgiven. To know that we are reconciled. Again, myths like truth is whatever you interpret something to be. In opposition to that, we are literally charged, according to our ministry, as we vowed at our ordination and installation, again, a good reminder yesterday, to keep the truth and to proclaim it clearly. Where does all this lead? Let's jump to our gospel lesson, shall we? How can the persistent widow cry for justice when truth is relative? We're not even told what the widow asked for because that's not even the point. The point is there must be justice. Even in an unjust world. Of course there must. No one would argue that actually. It's a good point to argue and to try to agree that there is one truth there. Justice is a good thing. We want justice. But guess what? Again, there's no real justice without real truth. And the truth is the bigger picture of the condition of our nature, our sinful original selves. God himself must have justice, and we are the reason. How do we find reconciliation then? Well, St. Paul ends with this rhetorical question, will Jesus find men of faith on the earth or not? Will God find more Jacobs and Esau's? Will he find more men faithful to the scriptures who know him from infancy, like St. Timothy? To which the answer is yes, God will know his people again, because we are the inheritors of his act of reconciliation for us, which was done, of course, when he came lived his life and died for us on the cross and rose from the dead for our justification. We are the inheritors of that truth. Could I be any clearer? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, in the name and for the sake of Jesus. Amen. And may the peace which surpasses our understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.